Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Inem King, and I'm program manager at Africa Women Board, AWB. AWB is um, committed to amplifying African female voices and also helping to create a world in which African women and girls are given the tools and the resources that they need to fully realize their potential. Once again, I want to say welcome to everyone for taking out time to be here. Um, we really appreciate you. And I want to welcome you to the premiere of the She Thrives podcast. The podcast is an important part of African Women on Board's Violence Against Women in the Workplace Initiative, and it is funded in part by Ford Foundation. Here with us today, we have Ms. Nicolette Naylor. She's the International Program Director, Gender, Racial, and Ethnic Justice. She's also the Director of Southern Africa at Ford Foundation. We have Ms. Funke Barua, Program Officer, Gender, Racial, and Ethnic Justice for Ford Foundation West Africa. And we have the Ford Foundation team. We also have our media partners. We have the um, AWB Expert Council, as well as distinguished guests who featured on the podcast. Here with us today as well is Dr. Obi Ezekwesili. Thank you very much for honoring our invitation, ma'am. All right, so for the opening remarks, I'm going to invite Dr. Nkiru Balong, Chair African Women on Board. Dr. Nkiru, over to you. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being here today. Um, she Tribes is our Safety in the Workplace podcast series, which features accounts of women who have faced violence within their working environments, ask questions of the institutions that attempt to silence them, explores why their stories matter, and offers perspectives from various thought leaders on the issue. In line with AWB's mission of mainstreaming African women's voices and fast-tracking their trajectory into the leadership roles of the future, our long-term goal is to mitigate violence against African women and its detrimental effect on growth in the workplace. However, there are significant gaps in understanding the extent of workplace violence in both professional and non-professional workspaces. At this point, I must point out that a workplace to AWB is anywhere work or duty is performed. And that includes places like hospitals, marketplaces, restaurants, homes, and even online. For African women to advance in these workplaces, they need to be safe. And for that to happen, decision makers need to understand the true nature of the problem and its prevalence in our society. This form of violence against women persists because people at the top, from CEOs to government officials to lawmakers, people who influence both corporate and social culture have not taken the lead. Organizations are often reflections of their leaders. And when these leaders avoid these issues, things become worse. This podcast was created to confront the culture of looking away to sensitize the public and policymakers about how widespread workplace violence against women is and its detrimental effects on our society. Once again, thank you for being here today. I hope this podcast gets us thinking. Thank you very much. And everybody, welcomes, oh, um, welcome again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nkiru. Thank you. All right, so we'll get right into it. For the next 25 minutes, we'll be listening to one of the episodes from the podcast. This one is focused on violence against women in professional workspaces. Enjoy. And I was so shocked because I didn't get this vibe from him prior to then. And then I said to him, I was I was shocked. I was worried at what was going on. And he said, I should go ask other bankers what they're doing to get the money. This is She Thrives, a safety in the workplace podcast brought to you by African Women on Board, AWB. The podcast is an important part of AWB's Violence Against Women in the Workplace Initiative and is funded in part by Ford Foundation. My name is Omoye Uzamire and I will be hosting this series of insightful conversations. On this podcast series, we will encounter the real-life experiences of women in various endeavors and fields of work as well as have conversations with industry leaders on the ways to make the workplace safer for women. Our first guest on today's episode is a banker whose name will not be disclosed, but whose experience we will all get to share in. Here is her story. 
Hi, I have experienced violence in the workplace. Here's my story. I worked in the bank for six years. I started off in operations and then I, moved, I was moved to marketing. As a marketer, my main role is to bring in funds into the bank, mobilize deposits. I was in um, SME and retail banking, so I had to bring in a lot of money from, you know, individual clients and from SMEs. This time I had identified um, an SME. I did my research and I, I knew that that man had the capacity to bring in the money I needed. And so I approached him. He agreed to open an account. In fact, he gave me the documentation I needed. He signed out the account package. And I was at the stage where the account was already open and needed to be funded. And so I reached out to him and he said to come collect a check from him. And so I went there and when I got there, he was trying to touch me. And I was so shocked because I didn't get this vibe from him prior to then. And then I said to him, I was, I was shocked. I was worried at what was going on. And he said, I should go ask other bankers what they're doing to get the money. And if I wasn't ready to give him what he wanted, which was sex, that I should leave. At this point, he was, he was getting, I'm just happy I was able to leave the hotel in one piece. I got back to the office and narrated the experience to my boss, who didn't quite take it how I thought she would. No one cares the process. What matters is the result which is bringing in the money. Besides, I had told my boss money was coming in and she also had told her boss that the money was coming in. And because it didn't come in, I was shouted at, I got a warning. It made me feel so terrible. I started to shy away from male clients. I was at a point I was getting overwhelmed with these advances and these customers that would always try to 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 sleep with you to get 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 money for us to warehouse their funds this is just one of my experiences also on the show we have two women of timber and caliber mahogany and oak <laughs> well let me go straight ahead to introduce uche ofodile a senior leader in the telecom space a champion of women and CEO MTN Benin Republic. We also have Nicolette Nelo, International Program Director, Gender, Racial and Ethnic Justice, Regional Director Office for Southern Africa at Ford Foundation. Nicolette is a women's rights lawyer and has had a long history working in the area of women's rights. These two ladies will join us today podcast to discuss violence against women in professional spaces. So in this instance, ladies and gentlemen, workplace violence was in the advances, the sexual advances and harassment of the client and in the non-protection by her organization. And I think that because of the prevalence of workplace violence against women, we as a people have become so desensitized, you know, by systems, by institutions that are there meant to protect us and by cultures and practices. It's so much so that things which should be abominable, which should be frowned at, are now shrugged off and considered as normal. I have a question for Nicolette Nalo. What kinds of policies should corporate industries and financial institutions implement and enforce in order to protect women from such situations? Thanks, that's a great question. I think first and foremost, an employer has a duty to ensure that all staff and all employees are working in a safe environment where their dignity is protected, where their rights are protected. You don't go to work to be shot at. So why should we accept that you can go to work and have, you don't go to work and expect to be mugged. If you were mugged at work, the employer would take action. So we have to contextualize sexual harassment as a form of violence against women. And it's not tolerated if men are behaving in a violent way in the workplace, action is taken by the employer to ensure the safety of employees. So the double standard around how we treat something because it's of a sexual nature, um, I think is problematic because employers need to see it as a duty of protection 
And I think employers have to move away from sexualizing it to treating it as an issue of power because it's about power and it's about exerting power over women in the workplace that that renders this this environment. The other point I'd make is that employers often think that sometimes when employers do act, they treat it as we need to just deal with a perpetrator. So let's deal with a perpetrator or let's treat this as this is an external person. She went to go see a client. So it's got nothing to do with us. We wash our hands, go to the police, report it to the police. But actually, you have a duty to make sure the culture, the environment that your women are working in is safe. So whether you are a journalist, whether you have to go out into the world as a sales rep, there is a duty on your employer to ensure that you are safe. And whatever happens to you while you are out on, on your work duty, the employer should be liable for. And I think those that standard setting in the legal framework, we need to be much clearer about the duties of employers, much more broadly. And we have to be clear about the duties of the state, because I think the state needs to pass these laws ratify international standards for for employers and then make sure that you actually acting in accordance to that so that a case like this doesn't happen the way it's just played out and i think we shouldn't just think this is an individual employer situation this is a systemic problem and this is unfortunately a very common response by employers yes yes i'd like to ask you uche or for delay what is the role that corporate leadership can play in these situations where systems are built which put women in tight corners put them in uncomfortable positions like these where they are you know forced to meet a target at their own expense for example you know where unusual demands are made of them in exchange for things that should be achieved on merit so i think if you ask most companies today they would say to you that we actually have a structure in place. They will refer you to their policy and they have a policy that clearly states no one should be sexually harassed and everyone should feel safe in the, in the workplace. Uh, they will refer you to their whistleblower line as well, uh, which you know is available for everyone to sort of call if there's an incident. But I think it's a step further and it really comes down to the tone at the top, you know? What I've seen and my experience is that, you know, who is leading that organization? And, and this is not right, by the way. I'm just explaining what's currently, what I've currently seen. Mm-hmm. Who is leading that organization will determine how seriously this is pushed in terms of protection of employees from this kind of behavior. Yeah. And we, we, we have a lot of work to do in terms of making the CEO's in addition to all the policies that have been put in place and the whistleblower lines and all the infrastructure, understanding the role that they have to play in ensuring that the culture, because ultimately the responsibility of the culture comes down to the CEO of that organization. I I will say this openly. What that organization is like culturally comes down to tone at the top. So we can have all these policies in place. But if at the top there's a blind eye turned to all of this behavior, guess what? The policies don't mean anything. If at the tone of the top, you know, uh, there's no accountability for this kind of behavior, guess what? People will not use the whistleblower line. So there is a need for us as, you know, and I'm speaking as a CEO, to step forward and say, you know, this is not acceptable. And I like to use the word zero tolerance so that everyone understands that that's the standard. It's not one incident, it's no incidents. Mm-hmm. Um, I had an incident, um, I'll just share a very quick story. I had an incident in, in a company uh, that I worked in where there was an, an incident of, of, uh, of sexual harassment. And what we ended up doing, uh, because after this you know, situation happened and we now went back right, to, to speak to employees and to women to understand what the culture was, because perhaps we didn't see that. And we realized that actually, you know what, we need to educate our employees. We need to remind them what the policy says. And we went through that process. We went through that process of going to every department, showing them videos. What does sexual harassment look like? And you may think that that sounds 
like everyone should know. But you know, the difference between someone saying something to you and touching you, most people will think of sexual harassment as, you know, physically trying to do something. But the fact that we showed videos of a boss saying, you know, oh my God, your skirt is really short. I really like that. Most guys hadn't really thought, and women, by the way, hadn't even thought that that was a form of sexual harassment. So we went through this process of educating the employees. And then we educated them on the policy. And then we explained to them, zero tolerance, zero tolerance. And it, it took me saying to the guys like, hey, you know, how would you feel if you were walking down the street? And I was like, hey, look at you in those tight jeans. And they said, you know, I would feel really uncomfortable. Exactly. <laughs> this is what we don't want you to do. And, you know, I believe in the power of stories as a, as a leader. And that was one of the ways in which we were able to really drive change within the organization. So they understood zero tolerance. Everyone was aligned and clear about the policy. Yes. And, you know, that was able, that was what we were able to do to shift the culture. So all of the things that you've mentioned, the whistleblower line, the policies, clear accountability, but ultimately the tone at the top is, is very important. Thank you so much. So, so much. So now back to Ms. Nalo, there are, um, there are a lot of instances as we've observed and we've, um, we've, we've spoken about how there's so many instances of sexual harassment and violence in the workplace that women face, but very, very rarely do they get reported. What do you think some of the reasons are that most cases of even overt violence, you know, isn't reported in corporate organizations? Thank you. I think the reason is the response that women get. If the, if the environment, we disbelieve women. Our starting point and management starting point is often to disbelieve and puts women on the defensive. And the cost to, to women, women often lose their jobs. Most of the cases I've dealt with or seen or heard about, the woman makes a complaint. And soon after that, if it's a manager that she's complaining against, issues of her performance will come up. Oh, she's not a team player. She's difficult. She hasn't been delivering on her tasks. And a complete disregard for the trauma, the psychological trauma that a woman goes through every day if she comes to work and a manager is, is harassing her. And often that does impact on performance. Um, and so the way we, the management structure within an organization can end up being very punitive to a woman who comes forward. Um, or if she's been absent from work, because often women will take time off work, they'll dread going to work, they will, you know, and they'll start getting disciplined for being absent. They'll be disciplined for not delivering on a project or not wanting to attend a meeting with a certain manager. And this is how we navigate the space where we say, I'm not gonna lodge a complaint, let me just avoid the person. Um, because women look at what happens when other women lodge complaints. And if they see soon after that the woman resigns and the perpetrator is still the star um, in the organization, then women choose to remain silent and they start looking for other employment and they leave. And then they speak once they've left the employment. We have to acknowledge the economic dependence and women's economic vulnerability in society. No one can afford to just resign from a job. And so do I lodge a complaint? Do I just resign from the employment? Um, is often the, the, the difficult thing that women have to sit with. And so I really want to call out Uche, that is amazing in terms of leadership. The political leadership and the commitment to this issue at CEO level is so critical because it's a game changer. It's a game changer for culture. It's a game changer for taking this seriously. And we found in our own organization, since our president spoke out about this, created a hotline, we have the video as well, and we make people take a test every year, and you're not allowed to fail the test. So it's ask questions, is this harassment? Is this racism? Is this um, sexism? And if you fail the test, your manager, you have to re-go the training. You have to keep undergoing the training, and every year we refresh the training. And then we rolled out a policy, a policy of no tolerance as well and created an anonymous hotline recognizing that women are often scared to come forward and, and lodge complaints. That has been a game changer in our own institution because before we, if, 
if management isn't disciplining people and you're not seeing perpetrators held accountable, women withdraw or leave the place of employment. And you have, I've worked in legal spaces, um, in law firms where all the younger women will know who's the harasser, who you shouldn't go in the car with, who you shouldn't go for drinks with. There's an unspoken code and we protect each other and tell each other, but no one feels comfortable enough to go to management and say, this is what happens. I think in my early days as a lawyer, if I had a CEO like you, Uje, I'd be able to go and say, this is what's happening and feel like it's a safe space. We have to create more safe spaces for women at senior management level because the CEO dictates how HR deals with an issue. And if HR is weakened, often HR is very weak in big corporate entities. Yes. And if it's a senior manager that's being um, accused of something, HR is often doesn't have the power. And so we need to make sure that HR is empowered, women are empowered, and that everyone is accountable in the workplace. I think the issue of we see more and more what I call malicious compliance, where people have a formal policy in place, a formal sexual harassment policy that they hide behind. And they say, we have a policy, we told you about the policy, it's not our responsibility anymore. And so people are hiding behind formal legal policies and not doing the hard work around culture. And so I think we need the formal legal policies, but we must be very careful of just saying there's a policy in place and often that formal policy could just result in a warning or let's just mediate the problem and women don't get healing and women don't get justice as a result. It's a way of, it's been used as a way to sweep things under the carpet. And so I think constantly revisiting whether our policies are speaking to preventing violence before it starts or whether our policies are just focusing on let's give someone a warning, second warning, dismissal, a punitive structure versus a transformative, preventative structure, I think is important for all employers to start thinking in that way. Awesome. Now I have one final question, and this is for you, Uche. In the case of our primary guest, where she talked about how her company reacted to her, how can corporate organizations create sanctions, you know, against the client, for example, this is a bank that's seeking to, you know, do business and make a profit. And our client has harassed one of their staff. How would, how would you suggest the company, the bank in particular, deal with such a client? I mean, I think let's start with, we can't, we cannot accept profit at all costs, right? Uh, I think we, we have to, that, that's got to be the starting statement in this conversation and that sometimes we're prepared to walk away from clients that don't work in the manner that we expect them to. For example, every year we at MTN, we meet with our various vendors and we tell them that we have policies around bribery and corruption and they're expected to sign those policies, right? And we say, if you uh, try to bribe an employee or if you accept a bribe from an employee or whatever, uh, you'll be blacklisted. We have no problem saying things like that. Why, why would that not be the same conversation uh, in this particular instance as well? I think it ties back to what Nicolette said earlier, which is, you know, we have policies in place to deal with all kinds of situations. If someone were to be violent towards you in the, in the workplace, they would be, I mean, violent, like having a fight, you know, there'd be no sort of like discussion. The person would be terminated, no questions asked. So how do we, 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 so we can do it. We know what to do, actually. How do we move these same conversations into the conversation around sexual harassment? And I think, again, for lots of for, for loads of corporations, I think that they're just seeing these conversations as separate. Actually, no, they're one and the same. If you are talking about the safety of the organization and safety of the employees and you want to protect your organization from any sort of legal, legal entanglement, then the policy should reflect or mirror each other in terms of how we handle them. And so back to your question around sexual harassment, how we could have protected this woman is to automatically say to that employee, you know what, we, we believe you, we, we hear what you're saying. Um, we're not going to deal with this client any longer. 
no questions asked. Because can you imagine having to go back? By the way, I, I don't know if she, she said, she didn't say that, but in some instances, those women are expected to go back to that same client to source funds, right? Yes, or to agree. still go back, correct. So I, I think, again, I'm, I'm gonna sound like a broken record. I come back to the tone at the top. You know, what is acceptable within the organization? She had a boss who said to her, look, look, go, you need to find, you need to meet your target no matter what. Where there could have been a very different conversation as to, oh my God, how on earth did this happen to you? Let us look into how we are sending you out there to meet your target and see if we can do things differently. If there's a different way that we can help you achieve your target. And also this person who has done this to you, there has to be some level of accountability because safety is not just about ensuring that um, the employees are not harmed. It's also about how they feel within the organization when they do their jobs every day. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think, you know, that's what I'm expecting. You know, how do you ensure that when an employee goes out, whether you're a banker or someone in telco or whatever industry you're working in, that you feel safe because your policies reflect that safety, you, you know? So that's, that comes back to us. And I, I mean, I, I just want to share my story again. Um, I know I spoke about it earlier about, you know, even for a CEO, um, this issue of safety was one for me, you know, I've always felt like I've had to have a second, I've had to have a second person in the room whenever I'm having a meeting, no questions asked. And the one time I did not follow this rule that I've had for almost 20 years, uh, you know, I had a very senior uh, person in government try to assault me, you know, tried to kiss me, tried to pinch my butt. And I'm a CEO. My job is to make sure that my employees are protected. But you can imagine that for me, I was ashamed. I was horrified. I could not believe that someone would do that to me in my position, mm. but also felt that I didn't have an avenue to speak up about it because I was worried about my job. And that's, that's actually what really helped me understand that I needed to be a lot more assertive and aggressive in terms of what sort of culture that I would have in my organization going forward. So it comes back to that tone in the top. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. We had an amazing conversation. Thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. African Women on Board remains passionate about amplifying African female voices, supporting African female empowerment, and helping to create a world in which African women and girls are given the tools and resources they need to fully realize their potential. If you'd like to collaborate or share your stories, please send an email to awb at africanwomenonboard.org. For more information, please visit our website on www.africanwomenonboard.org. You can also connect with us on social media, Instagram at awb.network, Twitter at AWB Africa, LinkedIn at African Women On Board, Facebook, African Women On Board. Thank you for listening. Have a lovely day. He was trying to touch me and I was... Thank you everyone for listening. I'm sure you agree with me that that was a very um, insightful session. Um, you know, every time I listen to the episodes from the podcast, I feel more strongly that um, the conversation of violence against women in the workplace needs to be heard. You know, the public needs to be sensitized on the presence and the effect and the various forms of violence. I also believe that um, perpetrators need to be brought to justice. During the course of our research, we found out from interviews, um, from, interviews from, from various women across various boards of various sectors of, of the economy that um, there is a significant gap in the understanding of violence against women. I personally found out that I have, been, I have experienced violence in the workplace so many times in the past. And so I want to hear from the house. Um, we'll take a few comments. Please raise your hand if you have any questions or if you have some comments. Um, I will call on you, you unmute yourself, and then you can ask your questions or make your comments. Oh, 
Okay. I see Mr. Anthony Awu. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, am I on? Uh, I want to ask, uh, I want to direct my question to Uche Okodile. I really want to know how can people get to listen to this podcast? Okay, I think that would be directed at me. Um, the podcast will air on radio, Beat FM precisely, every Wednesday for the next 10 weeks by 1 p.m. It will also be available um, on various podcast platforms by 4 p.m. on Wednesdays for the next 10 weeks. All right. Um, Omiko, Awa, I see your hand up. Please go ahead with your question. I see some questions in the chat. I'll just go ahead and take the questions. Okay, so someone is saying, how would you say, who would you say your target audience is with the podcast? Um, so our target audience would be employers, employees, um, HR personnel, um, students, teachers, uh, policy makers, pretty much everyone. You know, this is a conversation that affects, concerns everyone. So our target, target audience will really be everyone. Everyone. Okay, any more questions? All right, so I see a question here for Ms. Uche of Fordili. It says, how do you deal with workplace violence against women in your organization? Hi everyone. Um, I think I sort of mentioned a, a lot of the things that we do um, in, in the podcast, but I, I would like to reiterate, I think the most important thing that you can do within the organization is to be preventative actually. Um, and that means, you know, making sure that you have really clear policies in place. Um, I talked about zero tolerance. So setting that tone from the top of zero tolerance it's also extremely important to ensure that everyone in the organization understands what workplace violence means and looks like. Because if you were to ask 10 different people, they would have 10 different answers. So let's make sure we have a collective understanding of what that is. And then also, um, you know, making sure that there's a hotline in place uh, because there, there are many people who will feel uncomfortable, you know, either confronting their managers or speaking to leadership. And the most important thing that I, I've done as well um, in, in terms of prevention is to ensure that there's an open door policy. There's a lot of work I do that, that in terms of making sure that everyone within the organization knows that they can walk into my office and speak to me about any situation that they have, that includes drivers, okay? So everyone in the organization knows that they can come in and speak to me. And having that level of sort of openness and transparency within the organization is key. Now, if you're talking about something that has already happened, um, I think that there are two things that are very important and, and we must signal to women that when they make a complaint, that there will be accountability afterwards. Um, I think that there was uh, some, some mention on, on the podcast by Nicolette about how a lot of times organizations try to either sweep things under the rug, deal with things very quietly, you know, because they're worried about either legal impl implications of it. I, I actually think you have to go in a different direction where there's a lot of transparency because it's important to ensure that people around the organization understand that zero tolerance means zero tolerance, no matter the level of the person, um, that there's accountability um, and the accountability is Zero tolerance means the person leaves the organization. Um, also, uh, one of the things that we did uh, 
for women in uh, a, for a past organization that we worked in um, is to provide uh, therapy for the women who, who had suffered through this. Because I, I think we, we think about it like, okay, the person is no longer there and that's the end of the situation. But actually there has been harm done to that individual who has experienced the violence in the workplace. And so we have to ensure that that person feels complete, right? And we try to address this through therapy. So again, the biggest way that you can prevent workplace violence is prevention um, and making sure that, you know, you have very strong policies in place, strong tone at the top. But if still that does happen, to make sure that there is very transparent accountability um, and also some sort of remedies for the individual afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Uche. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here for Dr. Ankiru. Question here says, why did you choose to focus on violence in the workplace? Why not domestic violence? Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, I think we at AWB chose um, violence in the workplace um, because we know that one in three women um, globally uh, uh, um, face some sort of GBV, gender-based violence in her lifetime. Um, and when we're talking about GBV, we're normally concentrating on um, domestic violence, which is obviously very serious. But I think also given that, you know, the, what's happened with COVID and many people are working from home, we thought that it was important to actually shine the light on uh, um, violence in the workplace, which quite a majority of women, uh, at least on the continent and maybe here where in Nigeria, uh, um, go through and is not taking as seriously or doesn't seem to be taking as seriously. And because the lines are now blurred between home and work, it's sort of like it's interesting, we think, to actually um, have employers define what it, what it is we mean by um, violence in the workplace and also women in the market who experience violence who are not or you know you're a hairdresser or you're a domestic worker uh, and you experience violence sometimes it's actually women who are um, uh, 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 um, the perpetrators of this violence is women against women it could be a, a madame who's beating her house girl that's actually violence in the workplace it could be when you go to the market, I think people in, in people know when you go to the market, getting pulled and uh, you know shoved and pushed and you know uh, by by the guys in the market. That's violence in the workplace. So that's how we're defining this, and sort of like having a conversation, a serious conversation around this, especially as we can the next podcast we're talking about in terms of leadership. If what's the leadership doing around these issues? And sometimes we know that the leaders are themselves perpetrators. And so how do we actually uh, um, uh, um, take this more seriously, especially with younger women coming through? Thank you very much, Dr. Ankiru. Thank you for that. Um, we have a comment from Ms. Habiba. Ms. Habiba, would you mind just, we'd like to hear you. We'd like to hear, hear from you. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so, Hi, Nkiru. I do a lot of um, training on harassment and sexual harassment in the Nigerian and African context. And you hear from the ladies and they tell you that, look, they're having this policy is all well and good, but they've reported in the past and nothing happened. So why should they bother reporting again? And there was a case I was doing some training and it was the training was initiated by the CEO, who's a man. And in the course of the training, when we were taking them through, exactly as you said, they don't know what workplace harassment looks like. So we've shown them what it looks like in Africa, right? As opposed to in Europe or in the, or in, or in the States. And when we were talking about, you know, where you cross the line, where things become inappropriate, right? In terms of touch, let's say, you know, and certain comments. The CEO leaned over his assistant and put his arm, so this is a CEO who initiated this because he, ha he has a zero tolerance policy. He leaned over his assistant and put his arm around her shoulders to say, yes, you can't touch, you know, uh, you know, you have to be careful how you touch people. You know, so that he's sending a signal, he's saying something with his mouth and with his body language, he's saying something completely different. So what are the women supposed to take away 
from that incident and everybody laughed, ha, 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 ha. You know, so that confidence is really not there. Even when there's a policy, most harassers are rainmakers. They're, they make a lot of money for their organizations. They don't feel anything can happen to them. So how do we make, how do we reassure more women? Because nothing's gonna change unless more women report. For me, that I think that's very, something that's very important. So how do we reassure them that if they report, something will happen? I can see Kitty has her, her hand up in the in the in the window. Okay, Dr. Kitty, please go ahead. Hi, uh, hi, Ainem and Inkiru, and thank you so much. This is such a fabulous launch. And hi again, Habiba. Lovely to meet you again. Um, I just wanted to to say that you know, uh, one of the ways in which in which one can sort of uh, give a little confidence to employees that the, the, that the process will work is, is to organize the process such that it's more likely to work. So for instance, in, uh, you know, make sure that the, the chairperson of the anti-sexual harassment committee that to whom the complaint will go is a woman. Uh, make sure that at least half the people on the, the committee are women. Uh, make sure that various categories of employees in the company are represented on that committee. You know, non-working staff, cleaning staff, you know, th that kind of, of thing, uh, so that they're all represented. Um, and I think most importantly, make sure that the committee doesn't report to the head of the organization. Because when that happens, then as you very rightly pointed out, the people who are high up or powerful in the organization will always be protected by the head of the institution. And I, I'm speaking from the perspective of universities. I know that if you know uh, someone is, is bringing in big funding, for instance, or is a senior professor or is very famous or is well known or whatever it is, that that man is much less likely to have anything happen to him, even if the complaint goes to the committee and the committee processes it, because the head of the institution is looking at the future of the institution, not at the future of the woman who's been harassed. Um, and so in my university, we had, um, the Supreme Court in India had, had uh, uh, given a ruling that these committees will, will uh, uh, they are answerable to the high court and not to the head of the institution. So if you bypass that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, hierarchy, then there is a better chance that um, a committee that is not answerable, that is independent of the head of the institution and um, which is composed of not just women, but also of the you know various um, layers of employees in the in the company. That this committee will have a better chance of working quickly and fairly, um, and then maybe people will have more confidence that the committee will work. But if you have a committee that has headed by a man that has a lot of men in it that answers to the head of the institution, then this committee is doomed from the start. So I think that that the the constitution of these anti-sexual harassment committees in workplaces is really important. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Giti. Thank you for for sharing actionable steps to addressing violence in, in the workplace. Thank you. All right, we'd like to hear from Dr. Obi. We'd like to hear from Dr. Obi. What are your thoughts, Ma, about violence against women in the workplace? Um, what are your thoughts, Mark? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I'm clear. Very good. Uh, first, congratulations to the AWB, uh, Africa Women on Board, for the uh, very important work that you have done. Um, on the matter mm -hmm. of um, gender-based violence, I have always maintained that we do need a lot of data around the scourge because it's, it's a growing scourge within our land, within our continent, 
unfortunately, because we don't form the habit of uh, putting data behind uh, challenges that we have, people often dismiss things that should be taken seriously. And so I am very happy with the fact that you're investing very much in a more scientific way of organizing uh, the thoughts around this problem. I can only say do more. Uh, the more data that we can find around this problem, especially in the way that you're focused within the corporate uh, organizations, uh, that should mean that we can uh, de design the right kinds of uh, instruments to enable you generate as much data as possible and giving people uh, that safe space to share their uh, experiences in the ways that uh, lend uh, to action uh, would be very uh, critical. So perhaps another thing that you would do is the next level would be to uh, look at industry specific uh, kind of uh, focus so that you can then do almost like a ranking in which of the industries do we have more complaints of gender-based uh, violence in the workplace than the others. Uh, one thing that I have realized with uh, rankings is that no CEO wants to wake up and know that their industry uh, is, uh, you know, most, most culpable in, in something that is bad. So do more in that regard. Um, the second part of it is that data is often not enough. You have to put storytelling behind it. And that's why, you know, the fantastic uh, presentation by uh, Uche Ofodile uh, is one that should uh, be really amplified. I think that you have sufficient resources that you have gathered in the voices of the people, the very strong cast of women that you got their voices behind this issue. Please amplify it. Don't let it be buried in some little FM studio. Um, in as much a way as possible, uh, you need to build coalitions of partners. I think that the greatest endangerment uh, to some of these issues that matter to women is that, you know, everybody creates a little organization and twiddles around uh, a few people that know what they are doing. When we could achieve scale, please do everything possible to achieve scale. I am very glad that uh, someone like Abiba is a part of this conversation. She's uh, networked into a number of women organizations. It is time to achieve scale, get scale behind this, uh, because the more the people that are talking and acting on a particular issue, the greater their voice. And why is this greater, greater sense of voice important? It is important because my third point uh, touches on the fact that this is about power relations. Power relations don't respect uh, you know, things that are sentimental. You cannot be sentimental about women being abused in the workplace. Uh, it affects the productivity of these women. It affects the femme level productivity. It affects the, it affects the national productivity. And it becomes a barrier to the progress of women uh, you know, at cutting over walls and ceilings that are put before them. If they, all they see is that it really doesn't matter how much you grow, that ultimately you're not going to do, uh, you're not going to be respected uh, because violence against women is something that you would even confront as a CEO. We need, we need therefore to break down the power dynamics of this in ways that people, more people come around the topic. And my final point is that, um, you know, what, what is so crucial is leadership by example. We, we need, in the same way as we're focused on the, the places where things are not going well, uh, it would be good to find places like what uh, Uche described, um, at least a near perfect work environment where all the kinds of policies that would uh, support the voice or support people's safe space to complain and to know that uh, their complaint would uh, get adequate redress and that there would be accountability. In other words, they know that the systems exist, exist to prevent their being targets and that the systems also exist to punish bad behavior when it occurs because it's a matter of uh, how incentives and disincentives are aligned in order to bring the right kind of behavior out of people 
who have a proclivity for being uh, uh, predators of, of women. So um, it is important for us to uh, show those examples. Examples must be shown so that people know the aspiration that women have. This is the kind of workplace I want to be in. That is so important. Images matter. Uh, and, and connected to that is the importance of, um, of, of ensuring that, that, that when, when these abusive situations occur, they don't become news for just a brief moment. Uh, the women are too quick to move in on. I know many instances where things have happened and you know, there was so much outrage about it, but then people moved on and then another one happened and outrage again, and then people move on. Just making sure that we circle back on some of those key cases to show that we stayed on the message until justice was done is a crucial part of it. And I think that AWA can lead that whole, you know, new way of uh, uh, addressing the, the, these challenges. Let me just thank every one of you. I have benefited immensely from listening to you. I think that there is so much ground to cover, but I do believe that with voices like yours, um, that certainly uh, this is not going to uh, just be something that's uh, given half-hearted treatment by CEOs. We need to build a coalition of the willing. We might even just say, where are the CEOs that are willing to step up and step out and be part of the coalition of CEOs against gender-based violence? And AWA just uses that as a carrot to get many more of the CEOs really interested on this subject matter. Because until the leader makes it important, others hardly ever make it important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Obi. Thank you. Um, we'll just take one comment from Ms. Stephanie Coker. Hello. Hi. Can everyone hear me? So this has been an absolute um, pleasure to be here today. Thank you once again for this invitation and all the insights um, shared. Um, I would like to add to um, what Uche uh, Ofodile had mentioned earlier around educating people on workplace uh, violence. From my experience, also just speaking with people generally, I feel when these workplace violences happen, prior to them happening, a lot of times there has been signs around it, right? There have been little um, gestures or, or incidents very often before a final major thing uh, happens in most cases. So one thing is, and what Uche rightly said is, it's about avoiding the situations, not letting it get to the point where these things actually happen. So if we're educating people around workplace violence in terms of what are the little acts, what are the little comments that uh, we can consider as harassment or violence. Now, I think even more so on top of that, what if we can find a way to actually educate women on, with videos, on how to use body language to basically immediately create a borderline in form of a response to these harassments. A very short example, we all have our very animalistic, we are, we are like animals, right? Um, if a dog is coming to attack you, the energy that you transmit and the fear that you show is what that dog will act on. So as someone who is about to be harassed, if you get harassed by someone, the first point of the way you express yourself as in, do you stop, stand up straight firmly and look that person in the eye with a lot of confidence and then walk away? That is an action of this is not acceptable even without words, which can be very, very strong statement. These are, there are little body languages and little actions, I believe that we can create some sort of video around how women 
can already avoid these kind of uh, harassments to come up in the future. And I think that's something that one can add to how people are educated around it, apart from information on knowing what these signs are, what are the first initial responses that you as an individual can give, even without words, just through your body language, through your eye contact, through your stand, to give a message that this is a no tolerance from me. Thank you, Ms. Stephanie. Thank you for that. Um, we'll just take a final comment, a final comment from Dr. Kiru, and then we'll bring the session to a close. Thanks. This is really, it's a privilege to have everybody here. Thanks again. Just, um, Stephanie, that was very good. Um, I, I remember being chased around the table uh, uh, um, by by you know, like an investor. And so I don't actually know how a video will have helped me, but I do get the point about body language and all of that stuff. But you know, sometimes it's really aggressive uh, um, what women go through. And I think it's particularly, um, for me, in my, from my own personal experience, it's particularly sad because the younger girls are actually going through this. So you know, new, new hires, 21 year old, just started work and she's experiencing major violence. She's being chased around the table. Um, thank you, uh, um, Antiope, for your comments. We really appreciate it. Um, in particular, uh, um, we are working on amplifying this. This is a global conversation. We do have global partners as well. It's not a Nigeria thing or a Ghana thing or West Africa thing. It just it, it is a global conversation around how do women confront violence in the workplace. So thank you again, for, um, everybody, for being here. And we're looking forward to amplifying this. Um, it's going to be on radio. It's going to be on different platforms. We're going to be speaking more about it. We're going to have more podcasts. We're going to have Antiope, hopefully you'll be on one, and Stephanie and other guests here. More people will actually have a couple of male CEOs coming on board as well. Uh, and so it's not just women who are supposed to be fighting this battle. It's women and men together. So we have men also coming on board. So thanks again, everybody, for being here. And then great job. Thanks for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tonkiru. Thank you so much. As we bring this session to a close, I'd like to say a big thank you on behalf of the AWB team. Thank you for taking out time to be here from your busy schedule. We appreciate you and we hope that you would um, spread the word about the reality of violence against women in the workplace by sharing the podcast um, in your various networks. Thank you once again to the AWB team. We did it. Thank you. Um, I wish everyone a fruitful day. Thank you. Thank you. Well done.